all, this is first year. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Like I said, um, you guys probably don't know a whole, whole lot about me. I'm a shift commander in the Wallingford Fire Department, which is in central Connecticut. I started as a volunteer on Long Island. I'm not going to tell you how long ago, but the gray hair might give you some idea. The town I serve is about 40 square miles, population of about 50,000 people, daytime about double. I don't fight a fire every day. Uh, our city has everything from chemical plants to hospitals to big ho uh, post office facilities. But most of what we do, like probably most of you guys, is private dwelling fires, two and a half story wood frames, one story wood frame. So that's what we're going to talk about. I don't fight fires daily. Actually, when my shift is working, I think there's a low oxygen content, ventilation limited. We have a lot of difficulty breathing and not enough oxygen to support combustion. So my shift has been pretty quiet lately. I'm a shift commander. A lot of people say, what is a shift commander? I'm not a deputy chief. I'm not a battalion chief. I'm a shift commander or a captain. So I found a comedian who describes what I do better than anybody else I can imagine. So you watch this, I hope you get a chuckle about it, but I hope you don't agree with what he's saying. I really want to be a firefighter so I can drive the fire SUV. Because <laughs> I don't know what the fire SUV does when it gets to the fire line. Yep, that's a fire. <laughs> that is a fire. I guess we got to sit here and wait for the fire truck. Just the SUV. It does not have a water hose. The people gonna burn up until the fire truck gets here. It's sad and unfortunate. What's on the radio? But doing the fire SUV just directs people, which is pretty easy to do when you're dealing with fire. Okay, guys, right there. Where's that fire? I like for you to put water on it consistently until there's no more fire. They want to take a similar approach right here. They want to put water on the fire until there's no more fire. They have meetings in the morning. Okay, guys, hypothetically, if it's fire right here, what we want to do is put water on the fire until there's no more fire. We're going to take the same strategy right here. We want to put water on the fire until there's no more fire. They had the same agenda for every meeting, they just white out the date. Well, here's the scary part about that. On our day shifts, that's exactly what I do. I go, guys, hypothetically, if that fire was there, what are you going to do? I'm going to put water on it, but it's a lot more involved than that. Uh, we do this every morning, and I gave you about two dozen of them on this uh, CD if you take them on the way out. We ask 11 questions. What's your size up and radio report? Where's the first line? Uh, primary ventilation, primary where people, victims may be trapped. And we go through this from the youngest guy to the newest guy over coffee and bagels because I'm from the East. And we talk about it. So I do exactly what he said. Um, and it's pretty easy to do. You guys can do this yourself. Take pictures in your district. Cut and paste fire. Go to fire engineering and download pictures and use the pictures right from the websites from fire engineering or any other fire based web website. I'm not going to say. Um, before we start, I have a question. Any veterans here? Got to be one in this room. Got one? Put your hand up high. Anybody in the reserves? Keep your hands up, veterans. Anybody got family members serving? Well, I personally want to thank you guys. If you look at this picture, every picture in here is a fire service member or a family member of someone in the fire service. You guys, thank you very much. You do a great job. I appreciate it. I know fire engineering appreciates it. Uh, we want you to remember the fallen. And more importantly, something starting is new. Firefighters for Wounded Warriors. Fire engineering is going to be starting it. It'll be collecting money to help the wounded warriors when they come home. They're going to be looking for maybe some payroll deductions every week. I don't know exactly how it's going to work, but if you listen to Pollocks and Tactics on Fire Engineering Talk Radio this week, they're going to be talking about it. It's a wonderful cause. You guys, thank you. I, I truly appreciate it. And everybody else in the room, just give them a round of applause and just say thanks. And I truly mean that. Okay, we're going to talk about several things. First thing we're going to talk about is why do we need to talk about this stuff? We all know this. Our work environment, how it's changed. Command, that's what I do, so I really like that. We're going to talk about fire attack. 
We're going to talk about ventilation, and we're going to talk about search, and how they all fit together. Like I said, this class is going to be fast-paced. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to throw this all at you very quickly. Today we're going to assume, for safety reasons, everything will be done with full PPE, including SCBA. Physical condition, it's the white elephant in the closet. We never, never talk about it. We need to be in shape to do this job, whether you're a volunteer or career. You can't go in not being strong enough to do the job and having difficulty breathing while you're fighting fire. So think about it. Keep yourself in shape so the people you protect and serve will be taken care of. No excuses. Wear your gear. Wear it right. Don't wear extrication gloves at a fire. It doesn't work. And we all know what Billy says, WTF, I can't say it because I'm on this stage, but we all know what it means. SCBA. There are things, a lot of things that can happen to you. Cancer, and don't let this happen to you. They discovered an elaborate pot growing operation there in the garage. Firefighters say some of those marijuana plants did burn. They also say one person was treated for smoke inhalation. I inhaled so much smoke. I know you guys don't understand what he's talking about, but wear your gear, wear it properly. Chin straps, waist straps on your SCBA. And something the fire service is probably starting to talk about way too late in our careers, air management. Thanks to the Seattle guys, we're all talking about it. We all understand it. We're not doing it yet, and my department's not even close. But think about how much air, how long it's going to last, and manage it. And we're going to talk about a little bit of that on search a little later, what you can do to make it last longer. Private residence fires are the most common structure fires throughout the United States and Canada. It doesn't mean it's a routine fire, which we all think it is. There's nothing routine about it. 47% of our combat firefighter deaths occur in these fires. Residential structures, the private dwellings, two and a half stories. 75% of the civilian fire deaths. In the next 24 hours, this is a statistic I just learned, about 1,000 American homes will have a fire big enough to call the fire department to mitigate it. More civilians and firefighters are hurt here than any other fire. 2,500 civilians die in these fires annually. The last report I just saw for 2008 and 2009, it was 2751. So big numbers. We can address these numbers. This is from a study of a major industrial engineering university on the West Coast who would not allow me to use their name because I stole it from uh, somebody's paper. The attack and extinguishment of a residential fire may be the most complex, interdependent, time-sensitive time set of tasks found in any job. I didn't say this. I stole the quote, but they told me I couldn't use their name here. So if you want to see me after class, I'll tell you who it was. These tasks must be controlled and coordinated by an incident command system of some type. Whether you use NIMS, IMS, you have to control the incident. Pretty simple. If you're the coach, the incident commander, call the plays. How many football players? How many people played football in high school, college? Nobody? One? All right, that's better. Could you run the plays without a plan? You could, but would it be as efficient and as effective? Probably not. This is a good time for me to talk about Paul Coombs. He's hiding in the back of the room. Uh, Paul Coombs works very hard to get in the message about of the ills of the fire service, where we can be in the future. Um, he gets his message out. You guys see it in 30 seconds. I'm going to spend the next hour and 45 minutes talking about some of the things he gets out to you in seconds. But he works days working on this. It doesn't just happen. He thinks about it. He's a student in the fire service, and he gets what's going on. So, Paul, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Fail to coordinate... Fire attack, ventilation, and search means we have more empty parking lots and we hurt more firefighters. Uh, anybody seen that picture on the right there floating around the internet? It's an interesting picture. There's been a lot of interesting conversation on Facebook about it, but we'll leave that alone right now. This is the real reason we do this. That's a whole lot of Duffies. Those are my, those are my cousins. On my mother's side only, and my brothers and sisters and their kids. It was a family reunion a couple of years ago. Uh, Irish Catholic East Coast, so 
you get where that's coming from. Uh, but that's the real reason. Uh, pretty important. Your loved ones, your family, your friends, that's why we do this, so that they get to live another day and you get to see them. We have none to spare. Did everybody understand what she said? She said, we have a lot of children on our community, but none to spare. We don't have any children to spare. Chief PJ Norwood, that's his daughter speaking. She was kind enough to do that video for us. Now, the next 15 minutes, I'm going to be talking about how our fire environment has changed. I've hung this above the urinals in my firehouse. I recommend you guys do the same thing. Uh, it's, I call it potty training. You have a captive audience. They can look at this and they can get a message. Because they're not all listening to their chiefs, their bosses, but they have no choice. They have to look at this or they're looking someplace else and I don't want to know about it. Um, but he's telling us we should be fighting the dragon that we're fighting today, not the one from 25, 30, 40, 45 years ago. Because there's some departments that are 50 years ago. They're reading Lloyd Lehman's book as their uh, firefighter training. Not that Lloyd Lehman was wrong, but it's old. And again, thank you, Paul. I'll leave you alone from the rest of, rest of the class. Our work environment has changed from this, small capes, 1,500 square foot, three bedrooms, uh, two bedrooms. When my parents bought their house, when you looked in the real estate, it said two bedrooms, one bath. Today, when you buy a house, the real estate says 5,000 square feet, 7,000 square foot. It doesn't mention rooms. It just mentions square footage. They're bigger. They're McMansions. That's what happens when they burn. Large open floor plans, cathedral, vaulted ceilings. How many people have these in their community? <laughs> it looks like everybody. But you also have the old stuff, so you have to look at it both. How's it built? What's holding it together? What's in it? Everybody know this guy? The professor? What's his name? Brannigan. He wrote the first book. Building Construction for the Fire Service. It should be your Bible. You should all be reading it. There's a new one that Fire Engineering put out um, that's been updated with today's construction. You should own it in your firehouse or your own private library. It's available here, by the way. Members are made lighter, cheaper. They're held together with glue. Gusset plates. Um, there's nothing lightweight about it when they fall on your head, right? I want you to watch this. Tell me how many minutes it takes to make one truck on average. Welcome, boys. How many minutes, average? Just under three minutes. Any pipers? No pipers in this room? I'm truly disappointed. Anybody of Irish or Celtic descent? What's the name of the song? Um, I think it was going, home. going Home. It's an Irish funeral march. The pipers are warming up while they're building this stuff. This stuff will kill you if you don't pay attention to it and you don't know it's there. Like I said, <laughs> nothing lightweight about this stuff if it falls on your head. Dutchess Community College in upstate New York, they burned stick-built standard framing and truck-built with the same fire load under it. I speeded it up so you guys don't have to watch videos all day, although I like videos. Five minutes. Anybody had a guess on the stick-built? Who said 18? Close enough. You get a prize to take home. That's you. <laughs> Why, you don't wear it? You don't wear hats? It won't burn. 21 minutes, you're close enough. I've been doing this since 1974. Uh, 1974, when I started, if there was a fire, this is what I arrived at. How many people have been on in the fire service more than 20 years? Is this what you found? 
Wait a second, go back to it. This is pretty easy. You stretch the line in, you stretch it up the stairs, you put a little water on the fire, and it went out. You didn't take too much of a beating. You came out and went hoo 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 out on the street. What a great job we did, guys. It's not what we're finding today. And I'm going to get to why is that in a minute. Arrival conditions today. Do any of you guys see this today? What would Dave Dotson say about this? The pressure, the color, the volume, none of it's good. If I had a video of this, what do you think is about to happen? What's going to happen next? What can you do to stop that? Anybody? Okay, I hear ventilation in some parts. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Put water on it. What we need to do, and I'm going to get into this a little later, we got to get water on the fire fast. You know what? I'm going to get to it later. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But that's ugly stuff. That's fuel. It just hasn't lit up yet. You have to cool it down. Buildings are more energy efficient. Uh, vinyl windows, triple pane, double pane. Fuel loads have changed. Now, I'm not a scientist. I'm a firefighter, but I'm going to try to help make this sense. Any engineers in here? Nobody's going to help me out. Okay. In 1942, we had two pounds per square foot. In 1980, we had six pounds per square foot in bathrooms. In bedrooms, it was a low of 13 and a high of 25. Anybody have a guess what it is today? I'm going to guess it's at least double. Anybody have a tempur mattress? What are your couches made out of? What's your TV made out of? Frozen flammable liquids, not good. Are bur fires burning hotter? I hear a lot of that talk. I'm not convinced of that. But what is happening, we have higher heat release ratios of the fuel in the compartment. We have more energy efficient homes, which in turn increases thermal feedback. You guys get thermal feedback when you went to Firefighter 1? The hot stuff went up, it got hot on the bottom, it reflected down and everything just fed off each other until it reached flashover. With all these things, it means we get quicker flashover, not necessarily higher temperatures. Now again, I'm not an engineer. Wooden paper, seven to 8,000 BTUs per pound. Plastic, about 12 to 20. Big difference. Again, I need an engineer to talk about this, but I'll point to this. A 1940-style chair got to about 200 kilowatts, or calories is how they measure temperature, in 400 seconds. Over here, it's about 2,200 kilowatts, and I don't know what that means, but it's a lot hotter and a lot faster, in the same 400 seconds. Again, I'll say, what about today's chairs? What do you think? More or less? It's <coughs> excuse me, it's definitely more. I need some water, excuse me, guys. This is what I was taught in... In 1974, I wasn't even taught any of this stuff. They basically said, put the boots on and follow the senior guys around and do what they do. But when I became a career firefighter, I had to go to recruit school, and this is what I taught us, except they used another word. What was the word they used then before growth? Way back when? Probably could be a little more. Incipient? Anybody remember incipient? We're not allowed to use that term anymore. But the fire would grow, it would consume the fuel, and it would decay. You would come in and mop it up, and you'd be a hero again. This is what you need to know today. Have you guys been listening to the UL studies and a lot of the other stuff that's going on around? If not, I recommend you read it, all the UL studies on residential fires. We get the growth stage. The fire keeps growing until it runs out of oxygen, not fuel. And what's the first thing we do as firefighters when we get to the room, get to the fire? We either force the front door or Vinny Ventilat takes out a window on the second floor. You guys know Vinny? Does he work with you? Is he a volunteer with you? We all know him, and I'll show you a video of him in a little while. So we come, we vent the front door, and venting the front door is ventilation. We create a flow path to bring oxygen to the fire. Fire gets bigger, now where does that fire want to flow to? What flow path? Right where you are, over your head. So now you get a second growth stage, but look how much faster it is and much, how much steeper it is. We need to pay attention to this stuff. Remember, where will you be 
I'm sorry, how many people read the study? Anybody? I'm going to pick on you, PJ. Chief, how many seconds in a single family home will it take you have to open a front door if it's a ventilated limited fire? I heard somebody. They say 80 to 90 seconds, but 100 is close. I'm easy. You get a hat, too. Did you steal it from him? Was he the one who gave you the answer? You guys work it out amongst yourself. I'm not going to get in the middle of a fight. You, Wear it in good health. Okay, so this is the stuff you need to know. Flow paths. How many guys have said 10 or 20 years? Okay, you've seen this. You get to a fire, it's smoldering, you force the door, you're crawling down the hallway, you make the back bedroom. It's getting hotter and hotter. Is it because you're getting closer to the fire or is the fire growing? Probably both. But now science is telling us this is really what's happening. We need to be more concerned about our ventilation. The ventilation limited fire, I don't know what department this is, I'm not picking on you because I've done the same thing. But this is a great video I found on YouTube. Not a real big fire, there's some smoke. Is that pressurized smoke or just lazily flowing smoke? Yep. So they open the front door. And here's something I have a pet peeve about. They're inside that building with an uncharged hose line. Anybody think that's what we should be doing? If that room's gonna flash, how do we put water on that fire? Now we got some real ventilation. What's coming next? Has anybody seen this? Have you seen this in your department? Only two? Come on, I've seen it. I'm gonna admit it. I boarded it. I've done it. So you're all liars. So what do you think? Is that a good place to be with an uncharged hose line? So have we helped that homeowner? Not one bit. I'm going to move on, I'm not going to show the whole thing because if this surprises anybody, no. No, no, no. I'm going to show you a video you all did. Maybe. What you might not know is that candles burn at a thousand degrees and you could accidentally start a devastating fire by doing something as simple as getting off the couch. You wait back here? We watched just how quickly the average American the home can go up in flames at the Underwriters Lab facility in Chicago. In older homes, a fire like this could engulf this room in about 18 minutes, but with these new synthetic materials, modern homes can go up in flames in three minutes. That's right. Most homes built since the 1980s can Thermal burn up to feedback. six times Watch faster. This. Experts say the reason is simple. New homes are made with more flammable materials. Floor joists and roof beams, which used to be Is solid lumber, they're now wood chips glued in together. Home? Just three minutes in, that couch becomes a fuel log. The carpet a pond of fire. That. The room Anybody fills with noxious you gases. Survive? It's a death trap. Watch this recent experiment as an older house burns significantly more speed, slowly. So you we could build this entire thing. room out of natural materials, and it would burn far more slowly than made of synthetic materials. How much more slowly? 10 minutes slower. Those 10 minutes could mean life or death. S seconds count. Because synthetic materials are sturdier and cheaper, the scientists here say a return to natural products is unlikely. The real lifesaver for folks in new homes and old is awareness. The rule of thumb, if the smoke detector is sounding and it takes more than a cup of water to put out a blaze, leave the firefighting to the professionals. Matt Gutman, ABC News, Northbrook, Illinois. I show videos so I can drink water. Does this mean we fight fires like this? This is a lot of talk I'm hearing. Okay, if the buildings are made like, I can't say it, the buildings aren't made well, and the fuel loads are high, and flashovers quicker, maybe we should just hide and let the insurance companies take care of it. But that's not what we do, and that's not who we are. But we can't find them like this anymore, either. Yeah! Yeah! Guys want to see that again?
Anybody from the East Coast? You know what this is all about. I, I grew up on Long Island. I have the scars on my knees to prove that. Uh, anybody having a recruitment retention problem? How many volunteer firefighters in here? You having a problem? You're giving them low SAP credits. You're giving them tax deductions. Buy them a race truck and let them race every weekend. You'll never be short of young kids again. <laughs> all right, where are you from? Who said it? Who's, who's, where? Ah, you guys had a great team back when I was there. You probably wanted the best. <laughs> the 40 Thieves was the team, though. But I can't stay on that subject too long. <laughs> what we have to do is take all the stuff I talked about, combine it with your experience, education, take classes like this, read the research papers from UL, NIST, and come up with your strategy and tactics. Don't let anybody tell you what strategy and tactics are. I don't know how many people you have. I don't know what kind of equipment you have. I don't know what kind of buildings you have. But you have to take it and put it all together. Don't just have someone tell you, oh, ventilation limited fires, you can't go in. Maybe you can. Figure it out. Practice, 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 and train and figure it out yourselves. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. Either way, we need to learn from experience. What's the problem with learning from experience? Anybody? Okay, you don't get enough fires anymore. I'll tell you that. I told you about the low oxygen in Wallingford. But what else? Experience gives you the test before the lesson, right? So if you make a mistake and you don't have the experience, you're put on your class A. So learning by experience is great, only if you're getting experience. Uh, the burn buildings, the burn towers, the hay and pallets. Is that real? It's good. It helps you train stretch hose, but it's not the same as the building, especially the buildings with the few loads we're seeing today. 1403 says we can't do that. So the big picture is, Attack, most important. Anybody think attack is the most important? Anybody? How about search, most important? Ventilation, pretty important. Command, command's the most important. But really, what's the one tactic that we can use that will put the fire out? Fire attack is the only one that will put the fire out. It won't be the most effective or efficient without the other things going on but it will put the fire out. So what we have to do, that tells us we have to get that line in place quick. We have to ventilate to support that. It doesn't matter whether you have big city resources or small town resources, we have to do the same job. And I'm gonna pick on someone who's a firefighter in Brooklyn here. Um, my brother-in-law is on the job about five years in Brooklyn, and uh, this is the first fire he had the knob at. Can you guys count how many people in there? I don't have that many people in my department. Well, I do, but not on duty. Um, do you have those kind of resources? Anybody have those resources? Come on. Come on. You do from Brooklyn. Where do you work? Oh, Carney. I see. Okay. Not New Jersey. Okay. I don't know anything about that. Combination department, 83. Volunteer members, 10 full time. Okay. Tuesday afternoon at 10 o'clock. How many people do you have in the first five minutes? In the first five minutes? Yeah. On average, 35. Wow. I'm impressed. That's a combination department you can be proud of. Okay, this is me standing in front of a building in Wallingford. Count how many people there besides me. Come on. This is not a math test. One, two, three. There's more. You just can't see them. But you have to use the resources you have. If you have New York City resources, use New York City resources. If you have three-man engines, you've got to make plans to use three-man engines. That's what we've got to do. Attack the fire, put it out. Okay, we've gone through the changes. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about command. I'm going to show this video. Um, I pieced this together out of lots of pieces and parts. It's my theory on it. Um, I used to use a football metaphor or a baseball metaphor, but this probably works a little better. Anybody disagree? 
Does it make sense? You guys do the work. I'm the guy that stands out in the street with a radio and a white hat and looks pretty and gets my picture taken and talks to the press and the media and go, you did a great job. Well, you guys do all the work. Command makes sure that you go home every single day. If they're not paying attention and coordinating, you're not going home. Anybody have a problem with that? Anybody respond without doing command? Any departments not have someone in charge at every fire? Uh, who rides, who's the engine company boss? None? Okay, one engine company boss. All right, you might get a hat. <laughs> you show up in your department, I'm not gonna ask you where it is, you show up with your engine, chief or whoever's in charge of your fires is, is not there yet. What do you do? What do you say at a building fire? If it's burning, you see something. Officer, so I, I announce command, I take command. You do take command. Do you take an active part in command or do you? It's a stationary command. It is? Yes. Good. And where do you work? And I'm going to have to ask. I'm in Gatineau, Quebec, Canada. Ah, okay, good. Anybody not do that? Just give me one person. I know there's lots of you in here. Engine company officer take combat command, which is the technical term. And in my department, absolutely. The engine company, I have three-man engines. They show up with three people. If they don't get water on that fire somehow, somewhere, and they wait for someone else to arrive before putting on the water on the fire, I suspect you have good resources? Yeah, you have a lot of resources. Yeah. So that makes the difference. A volunteer department that shows up with two guys, or God forbid, one guy on an engine, say you got three guys, having one guy outside command, one guy running a pump, and one guy bringing a line in. No, I don't think so. Chaos, it should not mean chief has arrived on scene. Write that down. Chief has arrived on scene. And don't tell your bosses that Jim Duffy told you that. Because that could be me. Um, so as command, you need to do a size up. I'm not going to do Cold War's Wealth. Um, we don't have enough time for that. You've all, everybody knows this acronym? John Norman? Okay, we're going to move on. We need to identify what the real problem is so you can apply the correct solutions. It starts with the receipt of the alarm. Who does pre-plans? Great. You're a step above a lot of people. Dispatch information, is it useful or not? How many people say yes? How many people in Wallingford say yes? <laughs> okay. Um, it could be good. It could be bad. But take it with the knowledge in your community, your area. What's it like? Are they good? If they say 227 Main Street, and they say it's a high-rise fire, and you know there's only single-family dwellings there, it's not so good. Occupant information, is that good or not? It could be, but you have to apply it to what you're looking at. Now it's time for one of only two other war stories I'm going to tell. Many years ago, in an engine far, far away, I was a volunteer lieutenant on Long Island. Many old, to be exact. We showed up to a single store, it actually was a three-story house, with fire shown out of the basement windows and heavy smoke on the first floor. The occupant met me up right out in the street. Grandpa's downstairs, Grandpa's downstairs, Grandpa's downstairs. So I was a 24-year-old cocky volunteer lieutenant. You know what I did? We all went downstairs. We all went to the basement. Truck company, engine company all pushed. We took a pounding, knocked the basement fire. All of a sudden, get a radio report um, from a truck company, a uh, late arriving truck company. And they found Grandpa in a wheelchair on the first floor he went to get his cane and dropped his cane and he chocked himself into the corner. Grandpa suffocated in his wheelchair while we were downstairs, or so I thought. Uh, I get vindication in a minute. This woman lived on the second floor, or the third floor, I'm not sure. So to her, in a panic, in the middle of the night, Grandpa's downstairs, Grandpa's downstairs. So I recommend to you, if you get that, you go, ma'am, where is he? What room? Point to the room. It's good information but I made a bad decision based on what I was looking at. Who's going to be in a basement in a private dwelling at 3 o'clock in the morning? Especially Grandpa. Maybe he's got his tool shop down there. I don't know. But what's going on? At least send a truck company and let the engine search the basement. Let the truck company search the first floor. I made a bad call. The chief came up later and he supported the decision I made because that's what a good chief does. But you need to find out what the real problem is before. Is it occupied or vacant? So risk versus benefit gets mixed in there. Room and contents versus structure, is it different? If the house was built in 1920 or was built in 1975 or 1985, 
Is a structure fire different? Know your district. Know how they're built. Time of day. Uh, Volunteer-only communities. If it's 2 o'clock Tuesday, except if you're in Kearney, uh, Nebraska, uh, what's your manpower at Tuesday at 10 o'clock? Somebody give me a number. You're going to get four. In how long? Okay. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to get more resources, but where are the victims going to be? At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to get out on their own, unless he's a firefighter who's out all night, and, you know, but we won't go there either. Weather conditions, how long is it going to take the volunteers to get there? Hydrants frozen. Anybody from the south? Frozen hydrants are bad. I'm, not, I'm, not <laughs> I'm trying, guys. Okay, somebody. Um, I'm going to find somebody from Wallingford. The youngest member from Wallingford. This is one of our volunteer lieutenants where I work. Uh, great guy. What's going on? And just say it the way you would say it on the radio. Hey, uh, we had two stories one time. We had fire showing. I'll say, you know, put the radio station show on that, and then I'll make a fire attack on it. How are you going to do that? What's burning? I'm picking on you. It's the attic. It's coming from the east. How do you know it's an attic? That's a man cave. <laughs> There's a man cave up there. The entrance to that room is on the second floor of that colonial. Next time I show this, it's going to be a garage fire, so don't get too confident when I do that. But it could be. You don't know. A lot of houses built when this was built, they have what they call bonus rooms. And above the garage, there's actually a room with a video room, a pool table, couches. It's a man cave. So make sure you know what the real problem is. So let's look at this. If it's a garage fire, what do you got? What are you doing? What do you need? You've got to let somebody know, especially if you need mutual aid for a lot of things. This you need to move up to the front, right there. We need to start putting that up front in our size up. What has the potential to hurt our members? Now, uh, Anthony Villo, he's uh, chief in the North Hudson Regional Fire Department. He just got named Instructor of the Year. So what he's done, he's come to my town and tagged all the burnt out buildings in my city. And he brought his illegitimate son, Frank Ritchie, with him, and they tagged all the Any place we failed, that's what they did. So, okay, let's size this up. Um, you get called to report a structure fire at 3333 33rd Street. You arrive, this is what you see. Fred, I'm going to pick on you again because I didn't give you a hat before. What did you see? I got a one Say it's boarded up. It, me it says more to me when I'm en route. Okay. Now, you see smoke oozing out of there. How aggressive are you going to be with your crew? You go there, all the boards are in place, the doors are all locked and boarded up. You see no access points. Pretty cautious. But now you go to the back door and the boarding is ripped off. Possibility to go up, there's somebody in there? Possibility. Okay. I set you up to fail. Who wants to do this one? Raise your hand. Come on, be brave. Somebody? I'm going to the back of the room. Okay. I set you up to fail, so be ready. What do you got? Give me your, just building construction type. Okay. Um, I would call that ordinary construction. I would absolutely size that up. When we size up the building, engine company officer, what should you do? Especially if you're responding from the same house as your truck. Anybody? Pull past it. Why? Three-sided view plus make room for the truck. The truck owns the address, in my opinion. It may be different in your village. And you know this is not a three-story ordinary. This is a real building. Now, I use a lot of these videos to kind of surprise you and make you think. I'm going to try to train your mind to think. Don't always look for what you think it is. There may be something else going on. That's a real picture. I didn't believe it when I first saw it, but it's somewhere in Colorado. And why? I don't know what they did it. So you've got to get a minimum of a three-sided view. 360 is good, but you can't always do it. So myself as the incident commander, if I can't get a 360, Frank, what do I have to do? Excuse me? Report from the roof, but it's going to take a while to get a, uh, somebody to roof on a residential. So 
Um, someone's got to look at the back of the structure. Someone. Send somebody, assign somebody. Because if I don't see it, what does Chief of Villa say? That's what's going to get me in trouble and the members in trouble. Not going to see the big picture. So, 2 o'clock in the morning, dispatch says to you, fire on the second floor. What's going on in your mind while you're en route? You're putting your bunker gear on, you're putting your air pack on, lights and sirens, you're, go, you're being a little dangerous the way you're operating your vehicle, but that's another class. Uh, but what's going through your mind? What are you thinking you're going to find when you get there? Fire on the second floor. You're thinking where you're going to put your ladders when you get there. You're thinking where you're going to get, pick up a hydrant on the way in. So you show up at this fire, and in my community, the house was built in 1890 to 1910. So I see the fire showing on a second floor window. Where do my eyes go? Where are my tactics? Where does my brain get taken? Second floor. Who said that? Somebody. All right, we'll leave it alone. Okay. Where I live, that would be a balloon constructed, a balloon frame building. That second floor fire may be just a second floor fire. It may be a first floor fire. It may be a basement fire. So open your eyes and look at the big picture. We all learned something from that about ourselves and about size up. Real test. I set you up to fail again. Maybe. Come on. Okay, what do you see? What's going to hurt the members? Your size up? Did you see anything that might hurt your guys? If you're a command, you're responsible for all you guys. You probably know their wives, their kids, their girlfriends maybe, I don't know. Okay, we have one power line. Anything else? What'd you see? What's your size up? I'm four minutes behind my engine company. This is what I find on arrival. I set you up to fail. What do we do as firefighters? Ooh, ooh, fire, fire, fire. We look at the fire. Anybody see that? Anybody? Again, this is not a real picture. I cut and paste that in there. It was just to make you think. Anything could be going on. Don't ever assume. And we know about assumptions. Anybody see that? I know one person did because he saw it before the class. All right, that's me in front of a, a cape. Um, now, we do a lot of residential fires. Am I doing any of this? Coal was wealth, Wallace was hot, can. Anybody from the West Coast? Nobody from the West Coast? See, my New York accent kind of, nobody's from Seattle or Los Angeles or anything. Anybody know what a can report is then? Conditions, actions, and needs. I might be doing that. What am I looking at? What am I doing? And what do I need? This is an interesting fire for me. I grew up on Long Island, basically a city, and most people would call it a city. This is an area of my town or city that doesn't have hydrants. So I did 10 or more years as a volunteer before I became to the career department. Do you think I ever got good at water shuttles, tanker shuttles? Anybody think that? No, I'm going to tell you that. So I'm command. I got no hydrants. I got a lot of fire. I'm nervous. I hear Chief Bill Salata from East Wallingford sign on the air, tanker eight on the way. I'm like, Bill, your water supply. These guys work magic with water supply. If it doesn't have a hydrant, I don't know. I mean, I've been trained what to do, but I can't do it. Find somebody who can do that, someone who's good at it, and make them do it. We'll see this house again later on. WTF, um, that's Wallingford Transfer Facility. I don't know. OK. Who wants to volunteer to do this size up? Five o'clock Sunday morning, and Harley Sports the fire department arriving. Where are the bedrooms? Yeah, you got it. Anybody got ranches like this in their community? Anybody? I know you do. So, if you know your community, you absolutely know where the bedrooms are. In a typical ranch home, the kitchen, the living room's on one side, and the utilities. 
and the bedrooms are on the other side. So if you show up at 3 o'clock in the morning, what are you doing? A little risky there, but yeah, you know, I gotta get a hose in there. Anybody think that fire is in the attic yet? It's a, if it isn't, it's about to be. So you gotta get in there quick and knock this down. All right, who wants to size this up? I know it has nothing to do with this class, but I really like this picture. Any cops in here? Anybody cops that volunteer? You know what? I'm not even gonna ask you anything. I'm just gonna give you a hat. He's got a gun. So where are your uh, police officers, sir? <laughs> OK. You have to answer this question before I give you the hat. What do firefighters and police have in common? What's that? Protect and serve. Anybody got anything else? Who said that? They all want to be firefighters. They both want to be firefighters. They checked the wrong box when they took the test. Because you see, he's a cop, but he volunteers to be a firefighter for nothing. God bless you. Uh, both of what you do, now I guess I really have to give it to you. <laughs> Thanks for being a good sport. Uh, this was actually a training evolution that uh, Lieutenant Frank Ritchie was doing in his city. Okay, I'm not. <laughs> All right, I can't even go there. This was in my community, so your eyes can deceive you again. Nice home, right? 2,000 feet, maybe a little more. Fresh vinyl siding. Looks like they're having their lawn resodded. It's for sale. What would your size up be if you were sent here? Just what you're looking at. Two-story, wood frame, nothing shown, investigating. <clears throat> this was the den. Every room in the house looked like this. The outside, th actually, that's the house that they put there to replace the one that they tore down because it was so disgusting. Um, but that's in there. Can you imagine fighting a fire in there? It was like this everywhere. We went there for medical, by the way. That was the bathroom. Um, there was no water in the house, so can you imagine what that tub was filled with? Um, there were spackle buckets all over the house filled with urine and feces. I used the correct words. Um, not a good place to be crawling around in, um, with your turn here. But this is a real picture in a really nice neighborhood. So you never know what you're going to find. Now that you have the information, what are you going to do? Stand and stare? Scream in panic? How many work for chiefs that scream in panic? Nobody? How many of you ever worked for a chief that screamed and panicked? All right, now I feel better. How many of you are chiefs that scream in panic? <laughs> Nobody? Good, I'm proud of that. This is more to the company bosses. You can't be a moth to a flame. Our friend from Canada, someone takes command. Just because you see fire, you can't just go run into the fire. Look at the big picture, get the information out, what you're doing and what you need. What's about to happen? Is it about to flash? Did it already flash? Are the victims savable? You need to put that all into perspective. See rule number one about command. What's my, what do I get paid for? Anybody have a guess? Life safety. To keep my guys safe, make sure they go home to their wives and kids. But I get paid to make decisions based on very limited information. So the rule number one is, and I like videos, I guess you noticed that, but I want to make you laugh, I want to make you enjoy this and come back next year. We know where this is going, don't we? You've all been driving down the road and a squirrel runs out in front of you. You turn to the right, what does the squirrel do? It goes back and forth and we usually end up with a dead squirrel in a row. 
it's not only fire attack, search, and ventilation. There are a lot of other things that need to be coordinated and go with. It's a big puzzle. We've got to put it together. Um, tactical reserve, what does that mean? Do I have anybody standing behind me because everybody working for me is working? Everybody on scene. So what happens? They come out to change their bottle. What do I do? They've knocked the fire down. It's almost out. It's just burning a little bit. My attack crew comes out to change their bottles. What happens? Well, they're changing their bottles because you don't have anybody in reserve. The fire you almost had out now becomes a bigger working fire by the time you get back in. Because now the second and third companies coming out and changing the bottles, and nobody's putting water on the fire. Writ and EMS. You've got to have a writ. Anybody run without a writ on the first alarm? Okay. Uh, you a boss? Yes. How does that make you feel? Bad. You're uncomfortable with it. But it's the world you live in. I can't change that. Mutual aid is your writ team? Yes. How long before? Now you've got a working fire. Confirmed. Is that when they dispatch the writ team? Depends on the situation. Okay. Multiple calls, you probably get them loaded up front. So you have multiple calls, fire showing, they're still not going to dispatch you a writ team? Nope. Can, do you have somebody in a car or are you in a car? Okay, can you call and ask for that before arrival? And they'll give it to you. Yes. Make sure you do that. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Um, we have a, a downtown area that has less than optimal, optimal numbers of people responding. If I hear like it sounds something, I front load. I call engine company eight usually to come before I even arrive. Because if I wait till I arrive and call them, it's too late by the time they get there. And safety. If you don't have a safety officer, you got it. Communications. I've been on a fire ground. This is what my engine company lieutenants and truck company lieutenants are Mayday, mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? Now, the problem with this is when I'm standing in front of the building, the units can hear me just fine, except for some accent problems and me mumbling a little bit. But they can hear me, but I can't hear them. Because they go, rrr, 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 rrr. engine one, repeat. Rrr, rrr, rrr. They get louder, but not clearer. Anybody standing in front of the building get that going on? Yeah. So how do we fix that? I know it's exciting. I know you haven't been to a fire in three weeks. You're, you're all, ah. You got to calm down slowly and clearly say, I need another line. I'm taking a beat. Not, ah. it doesn't help. So communications are important. I think every firefighter should have a radio. Um, I don't think everyone should use it. It's an acronym I use to teach very often when I talk communications. Dimwit. Does it matter what I'm transmitting? If it doesn't, shut up. It's not what I usually say, but shut up. There's somebody with an, a, a real important transmission that you're blocking. Or you're distracting me from something else that I need to be thinking about. Remember that, dimwit. Command responsibilities. Thanks again to Paul Coombs. He's not here, so I can thank him again. We all have egos. People who rise to my level usually have pretty big egos. You need to check them at the door when you come to work or when you get in your car and drive to the fire. Delegate, then I won't be in charge. Nonsense. The more you give it out, the more control you'll have. Anything that you don't delegate, you own. You own every bit of it. Safety is your responsibility. It is anyway. The 360. If you delegate it, you can park yourself in front of the building and do a real command. Have a command post. Operations and your action plan. If you don't give it to somebody, you own it. I'm a big fan of this. If you have SOPs or SOGs saying what the first thing companies are going to do, it frees you up to think about plan B. Where I work, first in engine company goes to the fire. They don't take their own water supply unless there's something overwhelming that says, I better lay in. But our normal responsibility is go attack the fire. A three-man engine. I put somebody in the hydrant, I'm losing minutes. Second do, we'll supply them and bring the backup. First in truck, 
go to the roof, second in truck search, or whatever. If you have those things, it saves you time, it saves you plan making, because now you're starting to think about the next step, not the first step. It's very good for you. You need to coordinate all fire ground tactics. Accountability. Everybody do accountability? Anybody not? Does it really work? Do the systems you're using really work? Sometimes. Who do you assign that responsibility to? I was on a call, I won't say who was left in charge of it. I came in on a callback because it was a really big fire. You can see a picture of it in a minute. I got there and there was a pile of tags. A pile of tags on the bumper of the engine. People are coming in and out. We got mutual aid companies. Actually, we'll talk a little bit more about that fire in a minute. So I get there and I go, I'm taking command. I had to do a roll call to find out where everybody is. We got mutual aid companies working with our people, our people split crews. It took me almost 15 minutes to get a handle of it. So if that building went down before I got a handle on it, would I be putting on my class A? I hope not, but we're increasing the possibility. Resources. If you don't delegate it, you're responsible. Staging. Anybody stage? We don't have enough resources to stage in most places. First in companies, it's your responsibility to, I won't say a senior or higher ranking, but until someone comes and takes command. Someone has to be in charge always, always. You're responsible for RIT, responsible for EMS. Mutual aid, how many people do mutual aid? Do you know what they're gonna do when they get there? Do you prearrange it? Do you talk on the same channels? Do you like each other? Come on, do you like each other? Always? Okay. Well, you need to manage later arriving chiefs, and this may be a problem also. Um, you have to give them a job, and we'll talk about that in a minute. What do you think? Some mutual aid, mutual aid look like this to you? Is that how you feel sometimes? They're not taking my fire. You go stage, you do RIT. RIT's important. Don't just delegate that to somebody that you don't like. Because if it, if it hits the fan, see how good I did that? If it hits the fan, they're the ones that are going to save your firefighters. They bring chiefs with them too. Don't have those guys standing out at the command post because all they're going to be doing is critiquing your operation. Absolutely. So you break up the opinion brigade. You give them assignments. Into the Chief of Villa, I love what he says about mutual aid companies. They bring chiefs again. with them too. Don't have those guys standing out at the command post because all they're going to be doing is critiquing your operation. Absolutely. So you break up the opinion brigade, you give them assignments. Into the Anybody witness that? We even do it within our own department. Uh, that same fire I was just talking about, I was late arriving, I got a call back, so I didn't do a command roll. I got there, there was the shift commander, two deputy chiefs, chief of department, and a mutual aid chief from another town. And this is what I saw. There was four of them, and every place I went, there was four chiefs. You got four chiefs, use them. They're smart, they're trained, they're educated people, most of the time. Send somebody to the seaside. Send somebody to do interior operations. Find out what's going on. Use their abilities. Don't just stand together, because you know, when you're not paying attention, they're definitely critiquing your incident and laughing at you, going, I wouldn't have done that. Do you see what he did? So, um, use the Chiefs. All right, we're running out of videos. There aren't going to be too many more. I hope you like this one. Sometimes this is what I feel accountability looks like. Does yours look like this sometimes? Now tell me who's on first. That's right. I want to know what's the guy's name on first. No, base. no, what's on second base? I'm not asking you who's on first. Who is on first? I don't know. He's on third. Now, we're not asking third. Now, let's get together. How did I get on third? You're all too young to remember this? Name. If I mention a third baseman's name, who did I face playing ah, third? No, who's playing face. first? I'm not asking you who's on first. Who is on first? I'm asking you what's the guy's name on third. That was Abbott and Costello in the 1940s. I wasn't around, but uh, that's what I feel like sometimes. You need to manage what you need and what you got. Three-man engine companies, you can't do the job of six-man engine companies. NIST did a great study. It's actually in the CD I'm giving out. With the times it took for engine companies to do certain operations and truck companies. Very interesting what a three-man company can do, a four-man and a five-man company. Read it. If you want to uh, sway politicians, it might help you. Probably not, but it might. So 
You gotta look at what's going on. We'll go back to the can. You guys have talked about the conditions and action needs. Do I have enough people to do that? What do you do if you don't? Call for help. Offensive, defensive, or investigating. Pretty much that's what you do at most fires. Anybody do anything different? Nobody? Not even you? Um, okay, investigating, right? Nothing's showing. What's going on? And let the chief that's on his way in tell you what it is. Hello, chief. They just saw you on a video. I hope you caught it. Um, let people know what's going on. Defensive. Basically, you're keeping it from getting any bigger. You may be riding off property, but you're not going to hurt a firefighter to save a building that's already done. As this gentleman would say, a bulldozer overhaul tomorrow. Uh, if you're going to do a bulldozer overhaul, don't risk your men. Offensive. Aggressive interior attack. Quickly bring the fire under control. Primary search, secondary search, ventilation. Lots of water, GPM. Now, this is where I get confused. Offensive, defensive, defensive, offensive, marginal, indirect. You guys been reading all the stuff, paying attention to the stuff that's going on? What does it mean to you? What does it mean? It's a lot of different uh, ideas. Yeah. But what works for you? What have you learned? You need to become a student of the fire service read these studies, continue with your education, and what works for you. I don't like the word transitional. I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. But if someone says to me, engine one on scene, I'm going transitional. What? What does that mean? But if I show, if some of my engine company goes, hey, we got a rescue, I'm going offensive, then I'm going defensive. So they're going to put an inch and three quarter line, make the grab, and then they're going to back out and let the building burn down and protect exposures. The flip side of that is they show up, it's a really, really nasty fire, and they can't make entry, so they're going to go defensive, darken it down pretty quickly, which is maybe what they're calling a traditional attack today, but I always called it defensive offensive. You darken the fire down, you get in there, you do your job, you put the fire out, and you go home safely. Um, but I don't, you know, whatever you do, make sure it works for you, your resources, and your city. Become a student of the fire service. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but if you don't do that, how can you make sense of all this stuff? What did I say the first, second slide of the program? The most complex, time-sensitive, interdependent set of tasks found in any work environment. If you're a commander, this get rid of your Manuel. arrogance. Command you presence, no command. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. You know what? I was talking over that. We're going to say it again. You need command presence, but you don't need command arrogance. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving. Ah, you're killing me. I apologize, guys. I know I'm never supposed to apologize when I'm teaching, but I do. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. So, this is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over. This is a lighthouse, mate. It's your call. Any of you guys Hello? ever go to your Captain. boss and say, we got to do this, we got to do this, and they go, they just go. dismiss you? If you're a good boss, you pay attention to the people that are doing the job. They know it. Trust them. If you don't trust them, train them so you can trust them. Fire attack. This is what we all like to do. We like to rush in with a hose line, put water on the fire. <laughs> we all want to be the pipe man, nozzle man. It's a great position to be. It's the most basic of our tactics, but it's not all we can plan for. We need to ventilate and search as well as attack the fire. Put the fire out and most of the other problems go away. Anybody know who said that first? I have no idea, but fire service leaders have been saying it for at least 30 years that I know of. You in the back there, you know who said it first? <laughs> I don't know who said it first, but it's pretty much true. I think the original quote was, all the problems go away. That's not true. Most of them do. But it must be coordinated with other tacts, or it's not going to work. 
or it's going to slow down, or someone's going to get hurt, or the building's going to fall down in the morning. Where's the first line going in this fire? Anybody? Front door, why? Puts out the fire. What else is behind that front door? Stairs? So you can get to the second floor? Basement? Okay, uh, one question. If that's a single family home, you go in the front door. You can get to any place in the house by going through the front door. I've heard people say, oh, people will escape their normal means of egress. Well, I have in a house just like that. I use my front door probably twice a year. My garage is around back. So the statement that they're going to come out the front door because that's what they always do, not necessarily true. But you might trip over a victim going through the front door. But it'll get you wherever you need to go. Uh, who has a truck company that searches above the fire? I know there's not a lot of West Coast guys here. Okay. So if the engine goes through the front door, what are they doing? They're buying real estate for the truck company. They go up to the second floor. Now that fire starts growing, what can they do? Fire is not going to chase him up to the second floor. He's protecting his search crew and preserving their way out if it turns to doo-doo. Is that okay? First line. What's the first line going in that fire? You look like you want to answer me. Yeah. How about I pick on him? He's younger. Where are you going with the first line? Really? Nah. Nah. How are you getting there? Front door. Well, I was commanded of this fire also. Um, it's not one of my best stories. We went in the front door, or my engine company went in the front door. My thoughts are, you're going to go up the, the stairs, you're going to go open the door, put the fire out, and we're going to be home having supper in a few minutes. Well, the stairs didn't go to the third floor, and it was a Collier's mansion inside. So they got to the second floor, they had to stretch all the way to the back, and go up the back stairs, and then come back forward. Problem being, we talked about communication a little while ago, I'm standing out in the street. There's no white smoke. There's no steam conversion. The fire is growing. Engine 2 from command. Engine 2 from command. Status report. Oh, no. We're, we're working our way up. We're at the top of the stairs now. Now I'm standing out there. Still no water on the fire. He never relayed to me that there was a problem. So, go up two flights. That should have taken less than three minutes to put water on that fire. It didn't happen. So, we had a, a truck crew vent in the roof. They had to bend in a position because it started burning through the roof. They left the roof ladder there, which was a good call. You know, the ladder I can replace, I can't replace John Rainey. Um, so, they abandoned their position. They finally get water on the fire, fire goes out. But before the fire burned out, it burned the hooks off the roof ladder. That's something I never thought of before. What do you think happened to that roof ladder? How much speed do you think it got off a pitch that steep? I got a picture of the house next door where it went into. Now, this is not anything I ever thought of. I'm safety, I'm safety conscious, I'm looking at stuff. But there was a crew standing, probably as far as I am from you, from where that ladder hit the house. That could have killed somebody. So that's now on my checklist of things to watch out for. But I've never seen that before. But if you're an engine boss and you're not making a fire and you're delaying it, you've got to get the information to command. That was the staircase. A mattress piled up, but there was a lot of other stuff in the building, but we'll leave this alone for now. I'm burned to burn. We just talked about that. Fire shown at the front. It's not necessarily the best option. The fastest way to the fire in a private dwelling is through the front door. If the fire's in the living room, why are we going to go to the kitchen because it's unburned and stretched to the front? Anybody think it's a good idea? How many fire ones here? Come on, how many firefighter ones? Nobody? Fire twos, officers? Isn't that what they taught you in school? Unburned to burned? Put it in context, though. It, it's not the best thing in a private dwelling fire. It means the front door. And we talked about why, so we can keep going. Many victims have found these areas get to the rest of the house, the stairs, you protect the truck crew. 
Okay, now this is a garage fire. I know before it was a, a, a man cave fire. What do we need to do? First line. I'm going to let you pick two lines, so you don't have to pick one. Give me two. Give me two. Front door and garage. What's the one going in the front door do? Okay. So it goes in. You open the door. No smoke. You go to the top of the stairs. No fire. What do you do? Well, keep them there, but what are you going to do? Hey, boss. Hey, boss. No extension into the house. Now I'm pretty comfortable getting into the garage and attacking it from the garage. Maybe. But you got to get the information out. I can't make a decision unless you tell me what to do. But uh, good call. And I'll give you a hat in a minute. So I have the question, what's the real problem? So this is not necessarily a garage. You've got to figure out what it is. More lives are saved by a good staffed hose line and placed in the correct place. I'm going to pick, up, pick on my friends from New York again. But if we put the fire out, the truckie doesn't get his medal on Truckee Appreciation Day. Anybody from the East Coast? Anybody ever been to New York City's medal day? You're in a truck, right? You're in an engine. What do you call medal day in New York? Truckee Appreciation Day. This guy saves lives every day by putting a fire out. But who gets all the medals? The squad companies, the rescue companies, and the truck companies. So Medal Day is an important event in New York City, and I don't mean to pick on them. It's, it's actually more departments should do what they do. Guys, you guys do a wonderful job. If you're a boss, have some kind of appreciation day for what these guys do. Someone does a good job, you pat them on the back daily or once a year, but you can't be a chief, close yourself behind doors and not reward them. And I don't mean give them more money because you're never going to give them enough money. They're firefighters. They're going to cry. But uh, let them know. Let them know that you appreciate it. Let the mayor know what a good job they're doing. Anybody have these in your community? Nobody? In my area, we call these either a raised ranch or a split level. What is this official? Split level. So you go to the front door. What do you got? What are you faced with when you get to the front door? You go up or down. Where's the bedrooms? Where's the kitchen? Can you get to any place in that house from that front door? What do we got here? It's a basement fire. What do your tactics tell you to do if you read the book? Go in the front door. Basement stairs, open treads, open risers. That's a brand new one. What about that? You think that's in that house we just showed you? How about that? I don't want to go down that when it's not on fire. I'm not telling you not to do it. There may not be another way in. But this may not be the best way. Beautiful basement. Open risers, open treads. You got a fire going down there with the nylon carpeting, the overstuffed chair. Do you want to be coming down that? There's a beautiful back door. Come in, put the fire out. Now, just like the gentleman in the back with the garage fire, you need to get a line inside. Don't misunderstand me. But your men are safer if you find another way in. You got these where you live? Where I live, they're called Bilko doors. Anybody else call them that? Nope. <laughs> okay. We call them Bilko doors. It's a manufacturer. Is that stair going to collapse on you if you put your weight on it? It's just another option. Think about it. I'm not telling you what to do, but think about it. You might keep people safer, and you may get the fire out faster. Uh, from another UL study, attacking a basement fire puts you guys at risk. I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but it puts you over the fire. It puts you above unprotected stairs and unprotected flooring systems. Going interior may not be the best. It's actually, where I work, it's the SOP. It says, it doesn't say you will, but you should 
Go in the front door, find the stairs, and go down and vent from the Bilko door. Think about it. If you're a command officer, you may want to discuss changing your SOPs. Nevers. Are there any nevers in the fire service? There aren't too many, because you can't fight two fires the same way. But I have one never, and I think you should take this home with you. Never, never, never go below grade with a fire in it without a charged hose line. That's a never. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of size up in first line again. This is that same fire I told you with the chiefs going like this. Looks pretty routine. They took their lines and went in the A side of the building that you're looking at. The engine officer, God bless him, never did a 360, never did a three-sided view. From what you're looking at, do you think he made a bad decision? Not necessarily, but you know what I'm leading to. You need to do a 360 or at least three sides. This is on the CD corner. So you think they went up with that inch and three quarter. How much success do you think they were having with the GPMs that were being created on the outside and pushing into the building? It was not very successful. So look at the big picture. Don't just choose one view. Garage fire. I was in command of this fire, too. We were training at a local chemical plant. And I arrived with me and the truck. Reported victims. What do you think? Do you see any fire in the house yet? It's going to be there pretty quick if we don't do something. The engine arrived very shortly after. Does anybody think putting a line into that garage is a bad thing? You do. Okay, well, actually, the stairs is, is immediately to the left. But I, I was there. Um, but if you give that a quick hit, and I'll tell you, this is exactly what we did. The engine company hit that for about 20 seconds. It turned into a big cloud of steam. The second line went right into the front door within less than a minute behind it. Truck company got upstairs, searched the bedrooms, and this was all over in probably five or six minutes other than overhaul and mopping up. There's a huge amount of GPMs being created in that garage. And yes, again, my SOP say, unburn to burn, go protect. If that door is closed on the interior, you need to check that. If you open it and there's no extension, what have you just done to that house? Introduce fire. If not fire, smoke damage it. They're going to have to replace the whole interior of the house. And I'm not telling you, this is a second in time. You didn't see what I saw. But think about it before you commit your people that way. We're going to get into some pet peeves. Firefighting is a team sport. You have a three-man engine company. The first engine arrives with three men on it. Pump operator, officer, and a firefighter. Guy's got to run the pump. They start stretching. Second new engine comes in. They're going to stretch a backup line. I'm not picking on these guys. If it's you, I'm sorry. Um, but it's a big pet peeve of mine. What do we have to do? We have to get water on the fire. Anybody got a problem with this? What's the problem? Engine company, how many people have multiple engines? Engine one hates engine two. Engine two is going to get the fire from engine one, and they're going to laugh at him later. Um, volunteer career, I work in a combination department. Is it him showing up to say, I'm going to get this job from the career guys? Or is that that ever constant mutual aid issue? You need to fix it. You need to work out what you're doing with your companies, your mutual aid. You fix it now. Another pet peeve of mine. Always stretching the line dry, because we always do.
Good fire on the first floor. That line's not charged. Who wants to tell me a million other things that are wrong? And if this is your department, I'm sorry again. No SCBA on. They're not even turned on. I'm going to move on if I can. Um, anybody stretch into this dry? What's above their head at the front door? What would Dotson say? It's really not pushing that hard, but how far in is that fire? That line should be charged at least at the top of the stairs there. I'm going to tell you one quick war story. I was lieutenant on engine, but this time it was a career engine. Um, I stretched dry. Good fire showing on the second floor. I chose poorly. We got to the two-thirds way up the stairs. I called for the line to be charged. We flaked the line out. The firefighter with me was his first real fire after the academy. The hose went like this. <laughs> in the banister, across the stairs, and no water coming out, and the fire was starting to roll. The truck company had to come with tools, halogen bars and axes, and they were coming right behind me anyway. They had to bust the banister so I could get the water on the fire. Shame on me. The sad part of that story is I hurt my back trying to pull a hose out. I was out of work six months and had back surgery because I made a poor decision. Crowding the nozzle team. Who has never been to a fire that the nozzle team was crowded? Okay, look at this. They're stretching in. There's six or seven guys in that line. Do you want to be the nozzle man there and you want to find your way out the door? I don't. You can see it in slow motion. Um, he needed new underwear, by the way. Uh, department doesn't reimburse for that. I mean, they, they opened the line and they darkened the fire down. Nobody was hurt, but it's not a comfortable position to be jammed up by that. Ventilation. Done correctly and timed right, it will make the job go smoother and more efficiently. It's necessary to limit life, uh, fire spread, I'm sorry, protect firefighters, and increase survivability of victims. Chief Avello, a short statement on ventilation I have to use. Ventilation. NIOSH did a study of 444 line of duty deaths between 1990 and 2005, and in 87% of those LODDs, there was either no recognized ventilation or improper ventilation. So from that fact, you can look and see. Why are you venting? For life? That means you vent in the area where the suspected life is. For fire, it must be coordinated with fire attack. You need to have a charged hose line. Premature ventilation, one of the primary errors in the fire service. Venting remote from the fire, not venting the fire compartment. Venting behind the attack crew. I'm going to show you the right way and the wrong way. Actually, I'm going to show you the wrong way, then the right way. Remember I talked about Vinnie Vento a lot? Let him get a line first. I'm going to stop oh, taking the window. But what's he doing? No training. He's putting water on exposure. He's doing it right. And it's his exposure. That's Vinny. He's normally assigned to the engine. He got really excited when they put him on the truck. He, Ooh, I can break stuff. Did he help or hinder the firefight? He certainly didn't hinder the fire. Wait, I forgot one. I'd speed this up, but I can't. It won't let me. This is in Queens, New York in the early 90s. This is probably one of the most disciplined truck companies I've ever seen. Try to listen to what they're saying. Hear what he's saying? 
Engine 309, you got water yet? My guys would have had those windows out. When they take this window, watch the fire start going. If they would have been there when they first got there, guess what would have happened? But they waited to lose water, the room lights up, engine company 309 comes in, does their thing, put the fire out, and everybody goes home happy. Okay, see how that lit up? Can you imagine that two minutes ago when I first started this, what would have happened? 155-302, Okay, there's water in the fire. Boom! This stuff is simple. Coordinate it and it works. Venting the right space. You got the roof today. Fire's in the living space. You cut that roof, what do you think is going to happen? I'll tell you. The old roof is still under there. You think you're going to get that with a pike pole? This is in my district about three blocks from the firehouse. I watched this construction and I took the picture and waited for them to close it up. So make sure you're venting the space. If the space is in the attic, that's great. It's the living space, you're not getting anywhere. Venting the right space. Skylights, they're great ventilation tools if you have fire in the living space. You take that out and I have a fire in the attic. Are you doing anything to the attic? What do you got to do? Bust the sidewalls. They're called returns. Where I come from, I don't know what they call them by you. But you got to get the attic space open. With today's fuel load, you can't vent behind the attack team. You imagine this, you're stretching down the hallway, fire's venting out the back windows, you go and only doors open, and Vinnie Ventilat comes and takes out the front picture window. Not a pretty picture. You can't get away with it. Forcing entry is ventilation. We talked about flow paths earlier, right? Fresh air in, hot stuff out. Don't be in the way. Flow pass. Read about it, learn about it, because I don't have enough time to give you all the information. In my handout, there's UL studies in there. Read them. I can't do any more on ventilation because I don't have enough time. Deputy Chief Norwood doing a class on Friday that does residential structure fires, just the ventilation part. One side note, leave them on. Search, my favorite part. Metal day, remember? I'm sorry, Truckee Appreciation Day. Uh, one's in Bridgeport, one's in Queens. Search, to find something by looking carefully. What did they teach you in Fire One? Yeah, primary search is rapid. Rapid does not mean not thorough. Make sure you know what you're doing. Say again? Yeah, systematic. Um, I like to put people, have one guy search a room, especially in a residence, small rooms, 10 by 12, 10 by 10. One guy outside with the thermal imaging camera, one guy do the room. Then the next room, reverse it. That does two things. The guy who's sitting outside, he's doing nothing. He's not breathing heavy, so he's not using his air. So if the same guy keeps searching the rooms, the guy at the door has a half a tank of air, and the guy doing a search and his low air alarm's going off. So switch it up. You'll stay in longer, you'll search all the rooms on the second floor. Remember beginning, air management. Search has got to be coordinated with ventilation, fire attack, and through command. I get paid to do something, let me do my job. Note to any incident commanders, don't just say search the building. Go search the second floor, search the first floor, search the basement. Size up, is the structure occupied? What time is it? Are they in bed? Are you getting volunteers? You're not getting a search team? Search where? Where do you get the information? Who's going to search? Um, I have an ambulance. If they're not transporting, they work with the truck crew. They help with the search. Search what rooms? Fires on the first floor. We talked about that earlier. Let the engine company search the fire floor. I know the book says search the fire floor first. But the engine can do that and send a truck company or rescue company, whatever you guys call it, to the floor above. Don't send 
the search team, the same place the engine company is if you have limited resources. If you've got Brooklyn resources, you can send people every place. I can't do that. Which room first? What tools? Do I have the resources? Well, if there's somebody in there, you have the resources. You're going to have to figure out how to do it, what to do. Protect the search team and protect the victim. Can the victim survive the present condition? If it's post-flashover, the building's coming down, you really don't need to be in there. You will search eventually, but darken it down and do it safely. Are they savable? Risk versus benefit. The benefit is a life. To search or not to search. Any Shakespeare fans? You always search if there's a possibility of life, or, and especially if there's a probability of life. Every single time. That should not be the question. If there's a chance, we're going to search. The fire area is the most hazardous area. We talked about that. Um, hose line, search that area, truck somewhere else. Do you have one truck, two trucks, no trucks? Anybody in a volunteer company that only has an engine? Nobody? Everybody has? OK, Got, raise your hands real high, guys, if you only have engines. Um, who, who searches in your department and who vents if, you're on, if you arrive on an engine? Who, who searches and who vents if you only have an engine? Is it assigned by seat or arrival, or you just hope for the best? Arrival. So it is assigned. Hope is not a plan. I'm telling you that right now. I was teaching in a small volunteer company, and what I asked when I was teaching a class, I said, who vents? And I go, well, last time, I go, no, no, not last time, who is supposed to vent? They had nobody assigned. So it becomes an afterthought. You forget about it. Same with search. Someone has to know whether it's arrival, seating position, riding position, whatever you call it. Where are the victims found? You know. Bedrooms, hallways, behind doors, under windows. Areas of egress. That means hallways, staircases, and doorways. Where are the bedrooms? If this is in your community, you know where they are. I'm clueless in these kind of structures where the bedrooms would be. But you should know that. Where I live, I know where the bedrooms are. Second floor. 3 o'clock in the morning, that's where I'm going to find people. Do we just follow each other around in the dark, or do we have a plan? We talked about one plan. Uh, some places they always do a right-handed search whenever they're in the room. Whatever your plan is, stick to it. The tick myth. Who has ticks? Do you use them all the time, or do they stay on a the truck? They're a great tool. You guys have all been trained in search procedures, and you understand it. The new guys coming in, they're being taught don't let them skip the basics. When they come out of the academy and come to your firehouse, make sure they know where the wall is, the way out is. Thanks to Paul Coombs again. That's the last one. These two videos, I am holding the thermal imaging camera in the film on the right. This was in a tactical perspective. We had a, a live burn in East Haven, Connecticut. On the left is the basement below where these guys are on the right. How many thinks they can see a fire underneath them with carpeting and tile? Anybody? OK. Watch this, and it'll help you out here. That's the same fire. Basement, first floor. The only place you can see it is on the baseboards. You can't see it on the floor. So don't over count on that tool. It's a great tool. But you could be above an inferno and not know it. This I stole from Frank Ritchie. If unsure, hook the door. You got a really nasty room burning, but you got reports of the people in there. What can you do? What would you do in your department, sir? Yes, sir. Um, you got a really nasty room. It's gone, but someone reported somebody there. What have you been taught to do with your tool? Yeah, you, you can probe. Uh, but Frank Ritchie, if unsure, hook the door. Watch what this guy does with his foot to get a deeper reach into the room. And when he hooks the door, he knows to back up. It gets him right out the door again and puts him in a position to crawl away really fast. See what he's doing there? He got pretty deep in the room. When you're searching a room like that, you know what, I'll save it for the vent end to search. Vent end to search. That's another fire that I had. Um, Bend and the search is a good 
Good tool? Is it safe? Is it only a New York City, Chicago tactic? Everybody do VES? I think it's better, for, I mean, not better for small departments. If you have limited resources, this will get your results a lot faster. Don't be afraid to use it. What window? Ask somebody. Um, how do we get in? And this is something, is, again, with the UL studies you're talking about, delay your venting as long as possible. Wait till you're ready with your mask, ready to go in before you vent, because how long did we say? How many seconds? 100 seconds, 110 seconds, 80 seconds. So if you break the window with the ladder, put your mask on, climb up the ladder, how many seconds are gone? You're giving it a head start. Get your mask on, remember ventilation limited fires, clear the window, sweep, don't sound the floor, another uh, Frank Ritchie uh, production. How many were taught to sound the floor before entering a room? Do me a favor, just take your tool and sweep it. That was a pumpkin, but it could as well be a kid's head. Enter low, stay below the stuff that's pushing out. I think this is local. I apologize if anybody was in this. I wasn't there, but I'm really uncomfortable with this. So then enter if you can. So enter if you can, but you can sweep and probe with a tool, maybe reach your arm and get your face out of the venting stuff, but uh, be careful, you know, heroes are just dead firefighters. Get in quickly, close the door. The new term is isolate, close the door, that's all it means. If you close the door, the room you're in will lift. The smoke will go out, um, the toxic gases will go out, conditions will get better, but it'll have no negative effect on the fire because you're not venting the fire space. This video was taken in tactical perspectives when we're doing it. Watch the fire in these windows. Um, there was no water applied to this fire. It was just closing the door. It'll buy you time, the room will lift, I'm sorry, the vented window will now have no negative effect on the fire. If the door is closed, briefly open. Why do we do that? Why do we open the door if it's closed? See if any victims are behind the door and check for fire conditions. How long do you have? If it's rolling down that hallway and it's coming through that door, you don't have a lot of time. Or they may be applying water and now after you're done, open the door and let the whole building vent. Again, no water applied to this. These guys closed the door. Did you see it suck in because it was looking for oxygen? Ventilation limited because it was pulling that way, it was pressurized, it was pushing out, they deprived it of oxygen. Bottom line, in order to keep firefighters safe and have a successful conclusion, everything has to be coordinated. Search, ventilation, fire attack, through command. We must be all on the same page of the same playbook. No game plan unsuccessful. We must continue to train on SCBA emergencies, maydays and self-rescue, rapid intervention, bailouts and wall breaching. These are all important skills, but if we keep alert and coordinate all these tactics, maybe we won't need all that emergency stuff. Work together, do it safely and do it as a team. Parts of this program were stolen from a lot of people, mostly Chief Avillo, Frank Ritchie, and a few other people in the room. Um, I appreciate it. If any of this is yours, I thank you. But what I'm trying to do is keep you all safe. Borrowed brilliance is a term. I didn't steal it. I borrowed it. Um, this is an important statement. We do not raise, rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. Train, train, train. Don't just come and watch me. Don't come and watch DVDs. Go out, stretch hose vent windows, climb ladders, do the job, don't just read. But 
do all of those too. Enjoy your time here. And remember, the best way to improve your team is improve yourself. Who was at the keynote today? What do you think? Is he right? Is that your firehouse? It's my firehouse. And I'm proud to say that's not me most of the time. I do fall into it just like the rest of you. But improve yourself and everybody will be better. Get out of the house and train. Now, they've given me a soapbox here today, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, it has nothing to do with firefighting. Our economy is in the toilet. We can blame the Democrats, we can blame the Republicans, but if we continue to buy Chinese goods, we're not putting American people to work. If you have the opportunity, buy American. Sometimes you can't. You can't buy an American TV. Those hats I gave out, I couldn't find an American hat. I apologize. But um, if you can, please do. It'll put us all to work. I make my living off of taxes. People pay more taxes. I might get a raise someday. Thanks and stay safe. And most importantly, go Yankees. One more thing before you run out. Think of our brothers overseas. Say a prayer for them that they get home soon and safe.